we will um, begin the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our stakeholder briefing on HHS's integrative response to human trafficking. We're going to allow a couple of moments for people to continue to be let into the webinar, and then we will go ahead and get started. As um, some brief introduction to technology that we'll be using, we will be utilizing the Q&A function for this webinar. And so if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A box and we will answer them as time permits throughout the webinar, particularly during the panel discussion with our raised panelists. It looks like we have a good amount of people in the room. Catherine, would you like to go ahead and get started? Great, thank you so much, Kimberly, and thank you to all our uh, partners and um, uh, stakeholders on this call today for joining us. It is a pleasure for me to introduce our Acting Assistant Secretary and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Administration for Children and Families, Juyan Chang. She has been such a strong partner in the um, mission of the Office on Trafficking in Persons, helping us to build bridges, not only across the agency, but also across the department and with other federal agencies. And it is also an honor and privilege to have her here today with us. Um, she has chosen uh, to be with us on this call in some of her final hours uh, with the Administration for Children and Families in her leadership role. Um, our Acting Assistant Secretary Chang has uh, been a steadfast supporter, uh, not only over the last year leading the Administration for Children and Families, but she has had a, a lifelong public service, um, particularly to meet uh, the needs and uh, protection of some of the most vulnerable children and families uh, we serve. So with that, I will turn it over to Acting Assistant Secretary Chang to open us up. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Um, and as we close out National Human Trafficking Prevention Month, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the many accomplishments that you as survivor leaders, anti-trafficking organizations, communities, and allied individuals have made. I also want to encourage us all to look forward, considering the lessons we've learned and reaffirming our commitment to responding and preventing human trafficking. Human trafficking is a public health crisis that threatens the safety, health, and economic security of not only individuals, but their families and communities. At HHS, we understand that fighting human trafficking is deeply connected to our goal to ensure short and long-term health and well-being for every American. HHS serves many communities that are particularly vulnerable to human trafficking, populations that include children in out-of-home care, youth and adults experiencing homelessness and domestic violence, unaccompanied children and refugees, indigenous communities and individuals with a prior history of substance misuse. That is why we at HHS are committed to providing comprehensive support to individuals who have experienced human trafficking. As you know, the White House recently released the National Action Plan to Combat Human Trafficking. And through the action plan, HHS will strengthen early intervention and rehabilitation efforts, which include expanding access to benefits and services and increasing training for health and human service professionals. HHS leads the nation's public health response to human trafficking because we believe that like any public health issue, human trafficking is preventable. It is not enough to react to human trafficking after the fact. Instead, we must proactively address the underlying causes. 
As part of our prevention efforts, we continue to advance equitable access to critical resources that reduce the likelihood of human trafficking, including stable housing, economic mobility, and education. At the recent meeting for the President's Interagency Task Force to monitor and combat human trafficking, Secretary Becerra announced that HHS is establishing a task force to prevent human trafficking. Because so many HHS systems and program offices intersect with human trafficking, a dedicated task force will increase department-wide coordination and strengthen our anti-trafficking prevention and response efforts. The task force will ensure we implement our commitments in the National Action Plan. It will also allow us to enhance anti-trafficking efforts and develop new initiatives to better serve communities impacted by human trafficking. Establishing the task force is just the beginning of HHS's comprehensive and integrated efforts to prevent and respond to human trafficking. We strive to form additional partnerships with various stakeholders as we implement further initiatives, including the Prevention Action Plan that promote key priorities such as prevention education, second generation and whole family approaches, data collaboration, public awareness campaigns, and housing and economic mobility related efforts. As we continue to build an integrated response to human trafficking across the department, we look forward to collaborating with external partners, individuals with lived experience, and local communities. By working together, we know we can strengthen our preventive response to human trafficking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Acting Assistant Secretary Chang for joining us this morning and providing those remarks. And uh, before we go into the presentations from our regional partners, we wanted to share a short video to ground us in uh, HHS's contribution to the comprehensive federal interagency response to human trafficking, echoing and reinforcing many of the comments that um, Assistant Secretary Chang just shared with us. So Kimberly, I will turn it over to you for the video presentation. Human trafficking is a serious public health issue that impacts many of the individuals, families, and communities served through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It is also preventable. Human trafficking is a form of violence where abusers profit from forcing, tricking, or pressuring people into some form of work or commercial sexual exploitation. In a recent study, the International Labor Organization found that approximately 24.9 million people were experiencing human trafficking around the world at any given time, and thousands of cases are reported to the National Human Trafficking Hotline in the United States every year. Human trafficking can happen in families, intimate relationships, formal or informal work settings, or online. While human trafficking can happen to anyone, abusers target adults and children who have experienced other forms of violence or discrimination, are disconnected from support systems or displaced from their homes, and are seeking to meet basic needs such as food, shelter, safety, or love. Human trafficking threatens national security, public safety, and public health. The United States has a whole-of-government response to human trafficking. As part of this comprehensive approach, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services leads the nation's public health response to human trafficking by partnering with community-based organizations to strengthen screening, education, and prevention, funding essential services such as housing, health, transportation, and counseling, and monitoring trends and understanding what works through research, evaluation, and data collection. HHS programs and policies touch millions of lives every day, including underserved populations disproportionately impacted by and at risk for human trafficking. We assist individuals who experience human trafficking intersecting with community health centers and behavioral health, child welfare, runaway and homeless youth, domestic violence, 
substance abuse, Native American, and refugee resettlement programs. We work to prevent human trafficking when risks increase during natural disasters, unsafe migration, or changing market dynamics for healthcare products or services. We partner with federal, state, tribal, and local organizations, including groups led by survivors of human trafficking. We invite you to join in this effort. To receive free trainings and resources for health and human service providers, visit the HHS National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center at nhttac.acf.hhs.gov. To access services for individuals who have experienced trafficking, reach out to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call 1-888-373-7888, text 233-733, or chat at humantraffickinghotline.org. This video was developed by the Office on Trafficking in Persons at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Visit acf.hhs.gov slash ntrafficking to learn more. All right, thank you, Kimberly, for showing us uh, the that video. And for anyone who wasn't able to either see the video images or um, hear the audio, uh, that uh, video presentation will also be available on our website and we'll send um, out some information about that. And uh, I wanted to kind of ground us in um, why we chose to spotlight regional efforts on human trafficking as we close out National Human Trafficking Prevention Month in January. Um, as you saw in the video and heard from Assistant Secretary, Acting Assistant Secretary Chang, those local partnerships with community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, survivors of trafficking, and uh, state and tribal local government agencies are so key in making progress on human trafficking, particularly on the prevention side, whether we're preventing trafficking from happening in the first place or preventing re-victimization. And with that, uh, the Office on Trafficking in Persons, not only do we work across the department and with other federal agencies, but we also work with HHS regional offices. There are 10 regional offices uh, across the United States and we're spotlighting three of those uh, office uh, efforts on human trafficking, demonstrating the intra-agency and uh, federal local collaborations uh, to respond to human trafficking. So first I'd like to invite our colleagues from region three. Each of the regions will provide a presentation, a brief presentation for about seven minutes, and then we will open up um, afterwards for discussion and a question and answer session. And as a reminder, if you have any questions and answer or questions, uh, please feel free to use that function on Zoom. So with us today from Region 3, and this is representing collaboration across HHS, we have Trish Danner with the um, uh, Office of External Affairs and uh, Chris Wolslayer with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and Kimberly Murphy with the Children's Bureau at the Administration for Children and Families. So I will turn it over uh, to Chris and the team there. Hi, thank you so much, Catherine. We're really happy to be here to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing. Um, next slide. I want to uh, first mention that our region has a very strong and robust um, uh, task force. We are the Region 3 Federal Interagency Anti-Trafficking Task Force. Um, we were established um, probably back in 2012, 2013, um, and we have a very, uh, uh, we made sure that we included other federal agencies within our uh, region to, um, uh, so we can share resources and talk about issues that are happening. Um, I'm not seeing my slide. I don't know if that's Okay, good. There we are. Um, yes. So we um, it was it was uh, we were created after the Federal Strategic Action Plan for Victims of Trafficking in the U.S. that was um, implemented between 2013 and 2017. Um, I came onto the task force around 2008, and I co-lead it with uh, my colleague Kim Murphy, um, um, who was just mentioned, who who was with ACF in our region, um, who works for the Children's Bureau, um, and I also um, have a really great team 
as well, including Trish Danner, who is our outreach person who unfortunately gets to travel a lot around the region and she's been able to make a great uh, connection with other stakeholders. Um, next slide. So the next slide um, lists the uh, members of our task force. Um, and as you can see, they represented um, several different federal agencies. Um, and we do, they're a very active group, a very outspoken group. Um, and we've come to be known in our region as kind of a resource for um, uh, stakeholders who are working on anti-trafficking um, initiatives. Next slide. So um, we were really excited to hear about the RAISE funding. You know, funding is always a challenge, especially for those working in anti-trafficking efforts. Um, so we were awarded a $50,000 award, um, which we broke into two different buckets. Um, one around capacity building, capacity, I'm sorry, capacity building and one around a, a regional summit. I'm gonna talk about the capacity building portion of it. Next slide. And again, this was, um, kind of brought together through um, uh, Trisha's office, the IEA and Kim's office with ACF. Um, we kind of brainstormed how the money could be best spent. Um, Kim came up with the idea of using some of it to support um, building capacity for uh, foster care residential providers in our region, um, just to improve the high quality residential care and supportive service programs for child victims of trafficking and children in foster care at risk of trafficking. Um, so there's going to be um, two separate trainings uh, done. We were supposed to have one a couple of weeks ago, but Omicron kind of uh, pushed it out. Um, so one is going to be for 15 uh, child welfare professionals to attend a training on the My Life, My Choice uh, 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 program. And then the other would be a regional Love 146 facilitator training um, for about 20 uh, foster care providers. Um, and that would be an uh, in-person three-day uh, training. So we're really excited about that. Um, and there's been a great interest in this um, when we put it out there to um, those working in those areas. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Trish Danner and she's gonna talk about the regional summit, which is really exciting stuff. Thank you. Let me get rid of all that beautiful sunshine. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Trish Danner, Regional Outreach Specialist with the Office of the Regional Director in Region 3. Um, <clears throat> as Kim had mentioned, prior to COVID-19, I was able to do a lot of traveling throughout our region and got to learn a lot about what was being done to address human trafficking. And I came across two, object two things that were happening in our region consistently. Was first was there was a lot of reinventing of the wheel uh, our states weren't talking to each other and duplicating efforts. And the other was that there was a lot of great work being done that needed to be shared and, and, and spread across our region. So we came up with the idea of having a regional summit for the advocates and professionals that work in the area of human trafficking as opposed to an education and awareness event. Uh, so thus a year ago in uh, May, we uh, started planning for our inaugural regional um, human trafficking summit, which took place in February. Um, since then, as we were planning for our second regional um, summit taking place next month, February 9th and 10th virtually, and you can find information at the website there, disrupttrafficking.org. Um, the planning committee has evolved into the regional interdisciplinary collaborative working to uh, it should be disrupt human trafficking. Sorry about that. We changed it to disrupt trafficking because that's more realistic. Um, so the planning committee is the RIC. And the when you talk about uh, partnerships and stakeholders, one of our best partners is the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association. They've been a tremendous help. And they actually provide legal counsel for the RIC to become incorporated. And it has applied for the nonprofit status. Um, the RIC has an executive board composed of stakeholders from across the country, including two survivors. Um, the upcoming summit is survivor-led and trauma, trauma care informed um, is the focus. Uh, we have over 50 stakeholders as part of the RIC from our region and the national level with representation from OTIP, OR, DHS, the Office of Regional Director, OASH, ACF, and HRSA. But also, I'm just so proud to say that we have representatives from um, the offices of the Attorney Generals, the um, Virginia Health, Health, 
Hospital and Healthcare Association as well as the Delaware Healthcare Association. We have statewide organizations such as the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape, uh, Penn State University, University of Maryland. As you can see, uh, we have faith-based partners. So it's very diverse and that's why we are the interdisciplinary uh, collaborative. So next slide. Next slide. So um, when we came across this raise funding, we were so excited to be able to use it to support the summit, which was to take place both in person and virtually. It was going to be at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. Um, but COVID came along and now we are virtual. And thankfully, the raise um, OTIP is letting us uh, switch the funds from paying for survivor travel for the virtual summit to using it for the contractor to do the virtual summit. I'm talking fast because I don't have much time left. And um, we uh, also will be able to pay the survivor speaker fees. And what is remaining after the summit, we will transfer that, the remaining funds that we weren't able to use because of the virtual uh, summit to uh, the training funding. So we can add more people to the training. And um, I think that's it. I think I stayed within time. All right, thank you to our Region 3 colleagues and moving uh, right to the next region, Region 4, based out of Atlanta. We have Jeff Fredericks with the Administration for Children and Family, Tony Volrath from SAMHSA, as well as uh, Bethany from um, a non-government um, stakeholder uh, participating in this collaboration. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tony Bora. Um, unfortunately, our OASH partner was unable to attend, but as you can see, we're more than happy to use the slides that you're going to help us create. So next slide, please. The core of our project essentially lands in three domains, which are prevention, screening, and identification, and referrals to care for mental health and substance use disorder treatment. So the no wrong door approach to accessing services is common in the human services field, and we are actually applying this approach to our project. In addition to the survivors of human trafficking, we recognize that individuals who are at risk of or are currently experiencing trafficking access a variety of behavioral health and healthcare related services in a variety of settings. Think of emergency departments, community health centers, um, even jails. So we want providers to be able to recognize possible indicators of trafficking. From a prevention standpoint, we know that vulnerable populations have a higher risk of being trafficked, and we want providers to know what to look for. We also want them to have screening tools available to help guide their responses. And we wanna have coordinated services in place that are at the very least multidisciplinary, survivor-centered, evidence-based and trauma-informed. The overarching goal is that individuals get connected to the right level of care at the right time, and hopefully that would be at the first referral. So next slide, please. Early pulling with our state partners has already identified some gaps. Um, <laughs> I met with Jeff and Bethany yesterday and mentioned that Region 4 seems to have islands of excellence in a sea of fragmented need. And what I mean by that is that we're fortunate to have many organizations in our states, and they're doing great work across the region in the human trafficking space. Unfortunately, these efforts are not always well coordinated, and that's left us with some gaps or in a more positive light, I would say, opportunities. So as you can see, we'll ensure that our state and local uh, responses align with national evidence-based prevention strategies. These strategies will inform our approach and ultimately help define what we are doing across the region. Connecting existing stakeholders and creating new partnerships will also allow us to build on region support, region four's existing foundation, which is pretty well known. We know that silos are ineffective and incorporating integrative services will allow us to expand our bandwidth. This is also going to provide better care coordination for those in need. And from a regional support perspective, HHS has regional offices across the country. Um, there are many federal partners like myself that would love to be a primary point of contact for groups or agencies that are wanting to get involved in the uh, human trafficking initiatives. I am fairly new to the space, um, but super excited you know, to represent our SAMHSA regional office in this. So our goal is to create a regional action plan that supports coordinated resources, shared messaging, shared guidance, and shared decision making. And the plan will address regional coordination of anti-human trafficking responses and linkages to mental health and substance use disorder treatment. And I will now turn things over to Jeff. Next slide, please. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. 
One of the things that's going on in our project is we're trying to bring two big parts of the solution, if you will, together, and we need to do it carefully. Um, this slide represents an awful lot of work that is needed to link the public health uh, aspects of the work that we do with what generally feeds into what's going on on the investigation and the uh, criminal justice side of the equation. In order to do this, we really need some uh, to expand our partnerships. We need to hear from people throughout the Southeast region or across the nation who may be able to share experience and insights and ideas on how we can bring not just substance abuse and mental health needs to the work that we do, but also to correctly link these two huge and vitally important aspects of the work that you all do together as one. That's part of what we'll be examining with partners as we try to come up with a plan that is a doable, that is uh, informed by the states and supports the states, and uh, also lends itself an awful lot to uh, unique new partnerships. Um, we want to have heavy themes of prevention. And of course, we really want to integrate the services so that the services received by the clients are coming at them um, holistically and comprehensively. And that's what we hope to achieve. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. Bethany, I believe. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Bethany Gelo. And um, as was mentioned, previously, I am a non-federal person working as a project consultant and human trafficking subject matter expert supporting Region 4, which is the um, eight southeastern states on this particular project. I'm excited to get to highlight um, that our project is really going to rely on key federal, state, and local partnerships as we work on addressing all of the goals that Tony laid out, but also making sure we have those lenses of the criminal justice and public health frameworks that Jeff just reviewed. So um, I wanna highlight a couple of the a couple of key partners, our Southeast Addiction Technology Transfer Centers and Mental Health Technology Transfer Centers. Um, they bring an incredible network of stakeholders within each region for a state who are working on um, initiatives around substance use disorder and mental health. Um, so that will be really a key aspect of making sure we're identifying some of the correct community partners working on those initiatives and building that um, ground up response to address anti-trafficking at the community level and integrating these responses. We're also partnering closely with state anti-trafficking partners. Um, as some of you may know, ACF Region 4 has convened um, an anti-trafficking, anti-human trafficking work group since 2016 that's made up of stakeholders from a variety of disciplines, um, such as courts, attorney general's offices, law enforcement, child welfare, service providers, et cetera. Um, and that group is a key partner on this project um, and the interdisciplinary nature of that group, as well as those longstanding working relationships that exist there because of the convening of that group since for five and a half years now, will be an incredible asset to our efforts to integrate these services. Our goal with this project is to be really intentional and inclusive in our partnerships so that we facilitate innovative strategic action plans that will guide our regional efforts. Um, our federal and state partners, community providers, and lived experience experts will all be brought together to provide their important perspectives in developing the, um, the end goal, the regional action plan that'll be built upon those local and national resources. So ultimately, we want to create a plan that can be realistically implemented within the eight states in our region, as well as, you know, highlight regions as a welcoming point of entry for groups and agencies that are wanting to get involved in our anti-human trafficking efforts. So um, we're excited to work with all these folks and to have a chance to highlight um, our project, our RAISE project in Reason 4, and thank you. So much. Thank you so much uh, to our Region 4 colleagues and uh, straight on to Region 5 based out of Chicago. We have with us Angela Green, the Regional Administrator out of the Administration for Children and Families and a community partner um, represented through Brian Johnson with the Metropolitan Family Services. Thank you, Catherine, and um, thank you for the invitation. My name, once again, is Angela Green, and I'm the Regional Administrator for the Administration for Children and Families Region 5, based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and it was our office that initiated the Human Trafficking Housing Pilot 
um, in Chicago. And that was really after we heard the need from our human service agencies across our six states. Um, we partnered with our HUD sister agency to bring this to fruition, um, really examining the best location for us to house the pilot, which ended up becoming um, Chicago, where we were both based. Um, so together we reached out to our housing um, authority, Chicago Housing Authority, identify housing solutions and to implement a three-year pilot um, providing housing vouchers to survivors in human trafficking of human trafficking in Chicago. Um, and this began in 2016. It was after a one-year startup um, where we finally had our first applicant. Um, and we did not um, have our first person to um, get a voucher until 2017, when we really, really um, started working with our survivors. And by the time of the end of our pilot, the three-year pilot, we had 62 applicants. And out of the 62 applicants, 42 of them were housed. So it's almost a 70% housing rate. Um, we're now excited to be able to say as of... Um, August of 2020, um, Chicago Housing Authority decided to make the pilot an ongoing special initiative. Um, so we are still in operation and with the same um, six agencies. If you don't mind, move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, the six agencies that have been with us um, from the start. And um, one of the six agencies um, was Metropolitan and um, their role within our project was really to um, provide the data. Uh, so each agency, as they um, were taking in referrals and working with the families, um, they provided us with demographic information and some qualitative um, information for us to be able to collect. Um, one of the concerns we had was we don't have an evaluator who can evaluate our project to see if this is really something that is effective, is working, um, and where are the barriers, where are the, the, the challenges, so that we can begin to um, self-correct and begin to address those, those challenges that are being presented. Next slide, please. So as um, our steering committee began working, um, we thought of ways um, that we can ensure that we are getting the information that is needed so that we will potentially be able to do a research and evaluation project at some point. Um, we were working with the mayor's office of Chicago um, to see how we could get funding. We're also with our agencies to see how we get funding um, to look at evaluation project. And um, thank goodness for the RAISE project, we were able to finally secure that funding. Each of the um, participants within the steering committee have been committed to this project and Metro um, has agreed to provide the research um, for this end. We're individually contracting with um, Brian Johnson, who will speak, who will come next um, and talk a little bit more about the evaluation project that we have begun. Uh, I'm so happy to uh, be able to talk about this project a little bit more with the hope of understanding the impact of addressing housing needs for survivors coming out of both labor and, and sex trafficking. We'll know more about the real-time data available and how long it takes for someone to be housed. What does it mean to be successfully housed? Already having 42 uh, survivors housed throughout Chicagoland area, we'll know more in the, next, in the coming years about this particular project, its implementation and its effectiveness. I'm so happy to be working on this project and we already have a, a lot of data to speak to the length of time it takes, right? So on average, we know through this project, 142 days is about the time it takes. How do we use that data and make it more meaningful to the parties involved, uh, to the bodies involved to ensure that survivors are housed and how successfully. Thank you. Hey, thank you to our colleagues and partners out of Region 5. And uh, for if I fail to mention this at the beginning, forgive me, but the RAISE project that each of our regional partners had mentioned, uh, these are uh, funding partnerships uh, between the Office on Trafficking in Persons and regional offices. And I assume that for many participants on the call, when you think about uh, opportunities to engage with the federal government, um, some of you may be familiar with federal grant opportunities. And again, putting in a plug for grants.gov, that's where um, all federal grant opportunities, including those on trafficking, um, uh, are forecasted and posted. 
uh, but we also do so much work through partnerships and, uh, and that's what is referenced in these RAISE initiatives. Uh, so with that, I invite all of the uh, regional partners and uh, community organizations to join on a panel uh, discussion uh, for, uh, and I, I know there are several questions that have come in through the Q&A function of Zoom, uh, many of which we've already answered. And so uh, one that I'll just start off with, uh, coming from a uh, participant um, on this webinar is what is the best way to connect to um, uh, the regional HHS office? Because sometimes uh, it may be a, colleague, a regional office represented by the Administration for Children and Families uh, engaged in anti-trafficking efforts or facilitating those collaborations. Other times it may be other um, HHS uh, operating or program division. So I'll kind of turn it over to our regional partners on what is the best way of uh, connecting with uh, HHS leaders in the region. Hi, Catherine. This, this is uh, Jeff Fredericks. I'm down in Atlanta, Georgia, which is HHS region four. We serve the eight southeastern states. Um, I, I think I'm inclined to say, I, I think the best way to do it is the way that you can get it done. If you can come to us through the website, HHS has information on its regional offices on the website that identifies all of them, as do our key partners, SAMHSA, OASH, others, different partners in different regions. HHS also has a regional director's office and they could uh, channel requests in various ways. But uh, I'm with the Administration on Children and Families and others, um, and uh, my colleagues in other regions are also involved in the anti-trafficking work. So I guess my, my, my message would be uh, find a way to reach us. Uh, I believe at the end of this uh, event, there will be a, um, a contact uh, email offered and that will also link to the regional offices. Um, the, ma the main thing I would like to share is that we really do want to hear from folks. We need your views and your input. So whether it's email, telephonically, or through the web, uh, I hope we're findable and we really hope to hear from you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and then for region five, Angela, I'm gonna turn this one over to you. I know you gave a, a very brief overview and perhaps in the chat, we can uh, provide a link to where Bernadette can find more information about the emergency housing services. Would you like to speak a little bit more to that? Yes, thank you, Bernadette. Um, so as of um, 2021, we actually started um, taking in um, emergency housing vouchers as opposed to the um, housing choice vouchers um, within Chicago. And um, there, the beautiful thing about the, um, the emergency voucher program is that it also includes supportive services for the family, such as emergency services for furniture, for deposit for housing, um, um, rental assistance in that, in that set. And so if folks are interested in that, um, if you have those who are survivors of human trafficking, um, they can go through one of our six agencies to be able to um, connect with our um, voucher program. If you are an agency, um, and you're interested in becoming a part of our, our project, um, reach out to me. Um, there are ways I can um, connect our human service agencies to our project. Um, one requirement is that they have to be federally funded, um, but I do have another avenue to connect you with our federally funded housing agency in order for you to make referrals through that process. So I'm trying to make it sure I open it up enough so that um, all survivors in Chicago have the opportunity to take advantage of this this program. Thank you, Angela. And um, I'm just looking through uh, the q and it, it looks like there's already some interest from local organizations to plug into what regional offices are doing. And, uh, and we highly recommend that. Uh, one of the other hopes that we have at the Office on Trafficking in Persons is that if you heard of some type of collaboration, for example, uh, what Angela just mentioned happening in Region 5 around 
uh, emergency housing vouchers and you'd like to replicate that in your uh, community, please reach out. This isn't meant to be a, um, uh, a point of potential networking to replicate anything uh, you may have heard regarding housing, behavioral health, um, uh, service connections, uh, working with the child welfare system, in addition to coming up with uh, new innovative uh, new and innovative partnerships with regional offices. So a, a general question to our uh, regional partners um, on the call today, can you talk about how, uh, why it is important, even with the smaller funding amounts of these joint um, efforts, uh, why it's important to uh, fund local um, anti-trafficking uh, projects and initiatives? And perhaps I'll, I'll go back to uh, Region 3, since we haven't heard from Region 3 in, in, in a bit. Uh, Chris, you're on mute. If you, I see that you are speaking, but you're on mute. I'm sorry. Um, and I'm sure uh, most people on this call realize that a lot of the work is being done on the ground by, um, you know, anti-trafficking advocates. And, um, you know, they, the funding is always needed because, um, you know, they do a lot directly with the, the uh, survivors of trafficking. They do a lot with prevention. And a lot of their money just comes from um, small grants, small funding opportunities, uh, donations, and that sort of thing. So I think it's important that the federal government, you know, shows that we want to support the work that they're doing. So that's why we were so excited about um, having this funding come out so that we in Region 3 could support this regional summit for those specific groups. Um, um, because, you know, just getting it together is hard enough, scheduling it and planning it is hard enough, but finding uh, the funds to uh, uh, make it robust and make sure that the, the survivors are, you know, being paid what they, they deserve. And um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Catherine, this is Jeff in Region 4. Uh, yes, Jeff. With, with, um, with regard to why it's important to fund small ideas and projects at the local level is because um, that's where success ultimately lies with regard to service and support to the victims. Uh, it's also where an awful lot of creativity and innovation can be released. And in the regional offices, we actively seek out pockets of innovation, uh, which is why we need to make these contacts. But also I wanted to, uh, to say that we deeply respect um, the power and the need for success to happen at the local level. And I think that's why um, uh, uh, paying attention to those projects uh, often in, uh, sometimes in the form of funding is very important. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, so one of the other questions I had, there are a lot of uh, questions coming in along the theme of how do I connect to my regional office? And I think we started pointing to some of that, uh, but, but can you describe the role of whether it's the regional directors at the department level or regional administrators at the operating level or um, other regional colleagues? And if someone, so let's say someone does reach out by email or contacting you in some way, um, what is the role of the regional office in um, in responding to that local interest and in connecting uh, into the regional efforts. And this is Angela Green. I think I can respond to that and uh, have my jo colleagues join if they desire. Um, if you're trying to reach the regional office, one, depending on where your state is, and I think Jeff said it best going on the website so you can see what region is my state housed in. Um, and reaching out to the regional office will have those connections there. If you reach out to the regional director, um, typically they're going to um, connect you with the program office that your question specifically addresses. Um, if your question is dealing with human services, they're going to direct you to me, to the regional administrator of that particular region. Um, as a regional administrator, I am connecting with grantees and commissioners um, for each state around human services um, to make sure that we are pr promoting the priorities of the agency. 
Um, if you're looking for something specific to one of our programs, um, such as TANF or child care or child welfare, Head Start, um, Office of Refugee Resettlement, then we will direct you to the regional program managers within those offices. But typically, if you're coming around um, the topic of human trafficking, then you'll reach out to the regional administrator of each one of the regions, and we will direct you appropriately or um, work to address your concern. Thank you, Angela. Um, are there any other regions who would want to add to that? Of once you get that call and email, uh, what uh, what can people anticipate? Okay. Um, so if not, feel free to weigh in on that. And then I'm just going back to uh, the chat, Angela. While you're on screen. Um, there is a question, I, I will read it for all of us regarding housing and emergency services for survivors of trafficking. Is there a requirement that stipulates if the survivor has to be recently trafficked to be eligible for these services? And can you kind of talk through the eligibility criteria? So um, in regards to um, working with our agencies that um, will support the survivor, not all of our survivors um, are currently in a trafficking situation, but they had to have been in a trafficking situation and um, are still struggling as a result of that. And um, those are, um, we have individuals who have been trafficked for 20 years, some that recently got out of trafficking. So we have a, the whole gamut um, of, in terms of what their experience may have been with human trafficking. Um, but they do, our agencies do work with those that may have been out of trafficking for some time. Great, thank you. And um, to our Region 4 colleagues, there is a question from uh, Marisa. Marisa, nice to see you or know that you are on this. Um, she writes, we desperately need special housing for victims of human trafficking with severe mental illness. Is this being considered? And given uh, Region 4's emphasis on connecting survivors to uh, behavioral health, um, services, is there something you'd like to connect on on that front? Yeah, I, can, I can speak to that. Um, from the SAMHSA perspective, we have not historically um, been very involved in this space, but we're working toward that. Um, and we do fund a lot of crisis stabilization units. As far as long term, that is definitely something that we are happy to, uh, to address. It's easier to get folks into recovery housing for substance use disorders than it is for um, mental illness. So long story short, um, limited availability at this moment, but yes, we are incorporating that into our, into our plans and I'm hoping to see some success in, in the project. Thank you, Tony. And to our Region 3 colleagues, there's a uh, question that came in from Tasha. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, specific to the public health framework, can you recommend uh, the best resources, journals, links, et cetera, for evidence-based uh, projects? And is there anything you'd like to speak into that question? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I know um, that's always been a challenge, finding um, strong evidence-based training um, around the topic of human trafficking. I know that ACF does have a clearinghouse. Um, it's the, let me say, Title IV E Prevention Services Clearinghouse that um, it does a review a lot of the um, programs out there. Um, but yeah, it definitely is a challenge. And I, I'm hoping that um, more human trafficking um, evaluation is going to be done in the future on this work. Um, it's not that the programs or the trainings are lacking. Um, it's just the evaluation part of it that I think we have still need to work on. But um, that would be the place that I would go for that information. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. And um, to Tasha, we'll provide some additional uh, links in the Q&A portion of uh, where you can go for some of the federally funded program evaluations and some other um, HHS funded research. Um, the Department of Justice also funds research and evaluates anti-trafficking programming. So I'm just going to look through, I think we have time for one more question before uh, introducing our uh, um, 
uh, closing for our closing remarks. And I am, um, I'll just leave it with something very general for each of our uh, regional offices. Uh, can you just speak to uh, what's one takeaway that you hope participants from the uh, webinar today will uh, take with them as they go back into their respective organizations or talk to their colleagues of uh, what you've shared today? Let's start with uh, backwards, uh, Angela, with uh, Region uh, 5 in reverse order. Um, I would say I hope that you take away the power of your voice. I think our project was started just because someone asked a question to the secretary at, the, at that time. Um, and the question was, how can we get more housing um, options for our human trafficking survivors? And it happened. So recognize the power of your voice and use it. Thank you, Angela. And to Region 4. Thank you, Catherine. I'd like to um, uh, backstop and, and so, I'm sorry, Tony. Um, I'd, I'd like to really backstop and, and agree with what Angela shared that your voice really matters. Um, we need to hear your views with regard to prevention strategy, um, insights from what is happening in, in, your, in your realities, if you will. And the second thing I think I take away it is, is that uh, from here moving forward, we really have to integrate our efforts. Uh, our next steps need to be coordinated with one another's next steps, and, and hopefully we can achieve some of that. Um, I, I'd like to leave some time for my, uh, my colleague, Tony, in Region 4, if there's anything you care to add, please. You actually said what I planned on saying. The only thing I'll add to that is that we recognize that we are not the experts, and, and we are totally reliant on uh, what y'all are doing out in the field, and we're just here to help coordinate that. So if nothing else, just understand that you know we are here as federal partners, and we want to help. Thank you, Jeff and Tony. And then on to region three, Chris. Hi, thank you. Um, I think one thing that you could really do is just be the champion in your region. Um, a lot of the time uh, we're all pulled in different areas and, and we all have our jobs to do, um, but this is something that needs someone to you know, convene people, find the people um, and just get them together to have this conversation. Because a lot of people want to do this work. They just um, need someone to kind of bring them together. So the convening part of it is really a, a big piece of it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you to all our regional uh, colleagues and community partners for joining us in kind of a rapid fire presentation of what regional collaborations look like at the local level. And with that, I'd love to introduce our Deputy Assistant Secretary for External Affairs, Deborah Johnson. She um, uh, oversees the regional operations over here at the Administration for Children and Families and in many other external engagements. So Deborah, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you to all of the presenters and to all of the attendees for today's webinar. I want to thank you because you are showing a level of commitment to advancing this work. And it is only with your partnership that we can do this work. As the RAISE project demonstrates, our prevention and response efforts are strengthened through multi-sectoral engagement. While inter and interagency collaboration is important, forming regional and local partnerships is crucial for a comprehensive response to human trafficking. We want to hear from you to understand how human trafficking continues to evolve and impact the communities you serve, and that you heard that repeatedly through the presenters' conversations in response to your questions. So please reach out to HHS regional offices if you are looking to replicate any of the ideas you heard today or bring up other collaboration opportunities. Uh, the HHS task force uh, intends to move this work forward. So we will be pivotal in implementing a comprehensive response to human trafficking and better prepare us to provide individuals with the assistance they need to have a sustainable, healthy life. Through the collaborative efforts of the task force, HHS will scale prevention by expanding access to essential services, such as housing, healthcare, transportation, and counseling. Other key initiatives include developing improved public awareness and outreach campaigns grounded 
and gender and racial equity principles and establishing a technical working group to prevent forced labor and healthcare supply chains. As a foundational element of these efforts, the task force will strengthen data collection and research to help the many programs across HHS understand the ways human trafficking impacts different communities. And so this is the call to action. In addition to the coordination that will be achieved through the task force, we hope to increase both internal and external stakeholder engagement to implement HHS commitments in the National Action Plan. By partnering with federal, state, tribal, and community-based organizations, as well as grantees, NGOs, and other groups, we can strengthen our collective prevention and response efforts to achieve widespread impact. As we close out National Human Trafficking Prevention Month, I encourage all of us to unify our efforts. Please reach out with ideas for collaboration and coordination by emailing endtrafficking at acf.hhs.gov and reach out to HHS regional offices in your area. Thank you all for joining our discussion today. We look forward to collaborating with you in this important work. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you to all our presenters and participants on this call. We will end the webinar and follow up with additional information. Have a good day.